Hello and welcome back to WA Real. I'm your host, Bryn Edwards. WA Real brings you real and authentic stories from fascinating people right here in Western Australia. Stories to inspire you to take action to be all you can be. So how far do you think you could go on one breath? How far do you think you could travel, not only into the big blue, but how far could you travel into yourself? Today, we're going to find out as we speak with, speak with competitive freediver and photographer, Julia Wheeler. Born and raised in Western Australia, Julia is a self-confessed adventure addict. Through chance events, Julia ended up in a competitive free diving event and placed third. She then set herself the target of representing Australia in the 2017 World Championships in Honduras, where she went on to be ranked 12th place female in the event and second ranked Australian. In addition to this, Julia is also a professional photographer and filmmaker that has included highlighting the plight of rhino poaching in Africa. She is ambassador for the Perfect World Foundation and Take Three for the Sea. And very recently set social media a storm when her and a friend posted a video free diving through trash in Bali, raising much, aware, much needed awareness about the depreciating state of our oceans. Julia, welcome to the show. <laughs> that was really impressive. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for what, having me. What was impressive? <laughs> that Your introduction. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. The way that you just kind of told my life story so there neatly. Yeah, thank you. Oh, there you. we go. Well, we can stop the podcast now. <laughs> no. Okay. So um, obviously from that, um, you've got this amazing connection with adventure, ocean, nature. Yeah. Where does that come from? Does that come from growing up in WA, your family? Yeah, I guess it comes from growing up in West Australia and also since I was quite young I always had the need or the urge to just explore um, and I think that comes from my dad taking us away on adventure trips down south kind of to Margaret River or yelling up like horseback riding and yelling up or horseback riding in Kalbarri up north or you know there was always kind of somewhere to go or somewhere to yeah. explore and um, my dad my mum and dad always made that quite exciting so I think just being out in the outdoors and having these open plains and spaces and just that wildness I was just really attracted to it as a kid yeah um, and even to the point where you know I would go off an adventure on my own and leave my parents and Excellent. find police to take me home to them. So, <laughs> yeah, I and they just got used to it. So, yeah, I just and, loved exploring. And that was exploring on land and in the sea as well. I yeah, some time well, around Rottnest. Is- yeah, in Rottnest Island. So my parents, um, at one point, we went to we would go to Rotto every year, kind of as a family holiday. And one year, when I was a little bit older, and my sister was just born, she was in a pram. Um, I went for a little bit of a bike ride off into the over the hills <laughs> and I lost my parents so and it didn't really bother me it was starting to get dark so I thought oh well you know I was quite a chatty little kid so I went and found a police officer and I told him I was hungry so he bought me KFC or Red Rooster right yep and then I had to kind of guide him back home to where we were staying on Rottnest Island and yeah I just love that <laughs> I was never really scared of being on my own or exploring new things or going to new places. And I was just fascinated, like constantly fascinated by what was kind of next and what was around the corner or what was in the ocean or, you know, what was I capable of. So, yeah, just from being little, I was always very inspired. Excellent. (laughs) So as I said in the introduction, um, it was was almost like a chance encounter that led you to free diving. I understand you were yeah. at a, an event to photograph, photograph yeah. it yeah. and then you end up competing. Can you tell us a bit more about how that came about? Yeah, sure. So um, from being quite young as well, I loved holding my breath in the bath. And then <laughs> and when my parents used to take me to supermarkets, I used to hold my breath because I didn't want to be there. So I would use it as a defense mechanism as well. Did, were you the child that says, I'll hold my breath until I pass out? Yeah, basically. I didn't realize I would pass out, but sometimes I would. I And my I was just a really weird child. I'm still, I'm a bit weird, but anyway. What do you mean, um, what do you mean by weird? Oh, just different. You know, I do things very differently to most people. So in what way? Um, I don't know. I really throw myself into things. Like I don't, I just kind of give things a hundred percent or I don't know. And I'm also quite stubborn. So if things don't go a certain way or, you know, I don't know. I'm just very, I'm very, very passionate, I guess, about trying new things and just, yeah, I don't find many people kind of put themselves out there. I find there's more hesitation than trying, if right. that makes sense. Why do you think that is? 
I don't know. I'm not sure. Maybe self-doubt or kind of people thinking that, you know, the obvious, oh, that's not going to happen or I'm not going to be able to achieve that or how do I work through these things to get from A to B. And I just find that with a lot of my friends and people that I know that they kind of stop before they start. Right. So, yeah, I'm all about just kind of go for it yeah. in a way, which, you, yeah. which is part of why I ended up placing in a freediving competition and giving it a go and kind of overcoming those fears as well, which is a big part of the sport and yes. I guess ties back to where it all began in a way, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so how did you get – how did you end up competing in this event? So – um I had been going to Indonesia, to Apnea, Bali in um, Tulamben, which is in the north of Bali for four years. And I would go every year to photograph the freediving event because I loved being underwater. Obviously, I love taking photographs. And one year, last year, I went and my friend said to me, we need some more competitors. Um, go, like, why don't you enter? And... I kind of, I was like, oh, I don't know if I can do this. Um, and I just come out of it. I'd had a really hard year, a really, really tough year, probably the toughest year of my life. What made it tough? Oh, so many things. I'd finished filming my pilot for my TV show, which nearly killed me. I ended up in hospital with tick bite fever, which also literally nearly killed me. Um, I broke up with my partner um, and I was – just had no stability whatsoever like in my life and it was just I was really down and I was unhappy and um there was a lot going on with my family as well and I just kind of I was at that I was quite sad and I I wasn't even going to go to Bali like I wasn't going to go that year but my mum came over to Sydney to see me in October and she spent five days with me and I just, I kind of told her like, oh, I'm so tired. I'm so sad. You know, things aren't, I'm feeling like exhausted from this year. And um, my mum said, well, I think you should go to Bali. And I said, well, I don't know if I want to go to Bali, mum. Like, I just feel so sad. And she goes, no, just go, like go to Bali. I'll even pay for you to go to Bali. And my mum has never been that forwardly supportive. It's easy not to do the things that you know are right for you when you're in a spot. Exactly. And I was in a spot. <laughs> and so my mum kind of convinced me to go. So I went. So I, I overcame the first hurdle of oh, I really don't want to do this, even though I know it's going to be good for me. I just don't want to commit. I don't where want to commit. Na- where had the natural Julia curiosity gone at this point? Oh, I lost it. Yeah, I was so, I was just really down. I kind of had to get it back. And that's, um, this is part of the journey for me in the last year, actually. Um, but I, I just didn't want to go. I didn't want to go. And I, I did, I booked a ticket and I went. And as soon as I got there, it was still hard. You know, it reminded me of my ex, like being in Bali and, and he was a big freediver too. And that was something we did together and something that I just absolutely loved and really enjoyed doing with him. And so it was about going back to a place that I had been with him before and literally I'd just broken up with him three months before this, going, this is another reason I didn't want to go to Bali. And he was even saying, I might go, Jules, like, are you going? And I was like, oh, I don't know if I want to go if he's going. Like mm. I just, not that I I just didn't want to see him and it wouldn't have been, I don't know, I mean, it was really difficult for, for both of us. So um, I went back to Bali and anyway, I got there. And then when I got there, I was like, oh my God, this is so bad. This is the wrong thing to do. Um, but it ended up being okay. You know, I went in the water and I, as soon as I got in the water, I kind of definitely felt, you know, sad and I kind of had to work through that. And then when the girls said, Jules, you've got to do this free diving competition. Like, come on. And my really, my, my friend Trista, who's a West Australian girl too, she's an amazing diver. Um, she kind of has always been really supportive in my free diving. And then my coach at the time, Julia, who runs Apnea Bali, 
she was always incredibly supportive as well. So I had these two incredible women who were just like believed in me and were pushing me and to compete. Yeah, to compete. And Amber Narissa, who's Australia's champion freediver, um, she holds all the national records, I think, in depth. Um, she was even like, just go, do it, like give it a go. So I did. And it was the most nerve wracking, not, yeah, actually the most nerve wracking thing I've ever done in my life. And I've stood in front of 250 kilo ton lions. I've been charged in the wild by lions. I've been, you know, on the ground with rhinos and elephants and, you know, giraffes, like huge male giraffes. And I've been in the most intense situations, you know, in front of poachers, like interviewing a rhino poacher in the hub of, of rhino poaching in, in Africa. Like mm. I've been in these positions that most people would say I'm crazy to do, but yet alone a freediving competition was the hardest thing I've ever done. And I think it was because it was all to do with myself and looking right. into myself mm. and my ability to control, you know, not only my emotions, but what my ability was at that time. Right. Because, you know, you learn that it's your decision to kind of take these steps and make these choices and no one else can take that away from you. And that is so much no more apparent. no one else apparent. can do it for you. No, no one else can do it for you either. So it's really just you on the ocean. And I learned more about that this year for the champion, the world championships, but essentially um, that first freediving competition in Bali in November 2016 was just so crazy scary for me, like, so which which oh. category? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So which category did you enter? I entered all three disciplines. So which in are... you have constant weight. Yeah. So that's with the mono fin, which is everyone calls the mermaid tail. So yes. you have the constant weight discipline. Then you have free immersion, and free immersion is when you don't you know you don't wear fins. You just pull yourself up and down the line. Yes, yeah, so that's rope. basically yeah pulling down a, a rope. Down yeah, the... and then pulling back up the rope. And then you have constant no fins, which is the hardest, well, I find to be the hardest discipline. That's essentially swimming down. That's swimming down, swimming up. So mm. you breaststroke is the stroke that yes. I do, uh, which is the majority of what most people do. And it is tough. It is really, really, really tough and addictive. So, yeah. So you entered all three. I entered all three, yep, yeah, and I ranked. I came third overall. And By surprise, I don't know how, how I did, did it. How did you feel after that? Um, I felt pretty awesome because I went into it not knowing. I went into it just to give it a go, and I was petrified. Mm. And I went, you know what? I am so shit scared <laughs> of I'm around these athletes mm. and they are really good divers, you know, even the men, like incredible athletes. And I am such a rookie and I had two days to prepare myself for this competition, you know, and it's a proper competition. There are rules, you know, there are, there are, you know, you have to be, so like disciplined to a certain extent, you have to be um, prompt to your time. Like, you, you know, you can only enter the water at a certain time, like 45 minutes before you dive. You can only do a couple, a few warm ups, or we can do so many warm ups, but you need to know how many warm ups are best for you. You know, you can, you have your coach, you, you, you have all this equipment and you're, you need to, you need to work with it. Then you have equalization and there's, so many things and not only that but before you take that last breath you're being counted down you know your official top so you get three minutes as soon as you get in that square <laughs> you're in there you're in there on your own it's just you and the rope <laughs> the line and your breath <laughs> and your breath and your coach and no one can touch you and you also can't let anything touch you as well so you have to just immediately go into this state. And I, I didn't know any of this stuff. You know, I learned a lot of this this year. But last year I was completely clueless. Hmm. Like what am I doing? Okay, 
right, I'm going to hold my breath. Okay. I'm going to dive down to, and my depths were so, so shallow at the time. I can't exactly remember which category, which discipline was which, but I know I did a 22 meter, a 28 meter and a 33. And I was, I think the constant weight, which was the fin, but I was using bi fins at the time, that was 33 meters. And, oh man, that was so, so scary because in the the day before the competition, you have to announce your depth. So you have to tell the whole world, okay, tomorrow. So this this is not a, well, see how far I go. No, you have a depth you have to go to. It's a target depth. Target depth. Yeah, so the way a freediving competition works is you have to nominate your depth the day before you dive and you cannot change that depth. Once you've nominated, you've nominated and you're going there and that's it. And if you don't go there, you get a penalty or um, you'll get a yellow card or if you make a mistake, you can get disqualified, you get a red card. So it's the same. You've got the white card, the yellow card, the red card. You always want the white card. But, um, yeah. (laughs) Successful card. Yeah. And so you kind of, you know, you have to nominate your depth and then you have to do the, the dive. And you have to have a clean performance and then you have to, you know, then you get your white card. But, oh, my gosh, it was just, I just remember just I was trembling. I was shaking and I was shaking at world championships too. I was petrified. So free diving, it, there's a number of questions I have here. Go for in it. In the fact that to me free diving seems like um, a very – zen pursuit it is we call once it. you get in the zen yeah yeah <laughs> but yeah you're doing it in a competition and by by the very nature competition has a sense of ego and bravado about it because it you want to win so how do you marry the two well so when i i go into competitions not wanting to win firstly right. i go into competitions going what am i capable of <laughs> it's a competition in myself i guess in a right. way um, but also not, I don't, I don't know how to explain this one. Um, okay. Easy. You can see the paradox to the outsider. Yeah. It's, it's not a competition to me. So even at school, um, one of my good friends who I'm actually meeting up with, um, she's, um, how do you say it? Duathlon, duathlon, duathlete. Um, duathlete. Yeah. She's a, the number one duathlete now in Australia. She's incredible at school. She used to kick my butt racing, like running racing. And I remember I used to just let people go in front of me, like my friends. I was pretty, I was a pretty good athlete at school. Um, Mm. I represented the school and I was, I represented the school in swimming. Um, I was very sporty, but I was not competitive. So I'd just be running along and I'd see Catherine Connell on my left. And I just remember her kind of, we did a 400 meter race and I remember she really wanted to win. So I was coming up to the finish line and I kind of dropped back and I just was like, oh, you can go. So it's not really, I'm not a competitive person in the sport. Everything I do is what am I capable of? Right. I'm not competitive in my, my career. I'm not competitive in how I do things. Mm. I just do them the way that, you know, what am I capable of? What, what does my heart tell me to do? You know, what, what can I do? How far can I go? What can I explore here? That's what freediving and right. competing is for me. So it's a more a collection of people testing themselves all together. Yep. And, yes, there will be an eventual winner. Exactly, and there always is. But some freedivers definitely do it to compete. Yes. 100%. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I don't know whether this is a true reflection of the sport, but having watched The Big Blue, you had the two very different characters. Yeah. Venzo. You have yeah. a yeah, you have a lot of really different characters in freediving. So yeah. you just kind of do your own thing and you stay, you know, in your own head and you don't worry about anyone else's business or how they're training or what their goals are because you'll never match their performance if that's what you're aiming mm. to achieve. And I suppose if you if you were trying to match somebody else's performance, you wouldn't be getting the best out of yourself. No, you've, that's just pressure. Mm. Like, oh, this person's diving to 50 metres, I'm going to dive to 50 metres. It doesn't work like that. Yes. It's like, you know, what what you know, what can I do? <laughs> so you go to Bali, you place the – you're obviously feeling good about yourself. I was so stoked. Yeah. I was the, a um, I imagine at this point the whole drama with the boyfriend and everything was a distant memory. My ex boyfriend. No, that kind of lingered for a little but while. Reduced. <laughs> it reduced, yeah, but it yeah. still lingered. It was still there. So, at what point did you then set yourself the goal of world championships this year? 
So I, um, so this year has been a funny year. Um, after I filmed my TV pilot last year, which was a four year project, I, I kind of, the beginning of the year was really kind of a little bit, um, I don't know, a little tough, I guess, kind of, you know, when you come out of a breakup and you have projects you've worked on for so long, you need to kind of re, you know, motivate yourself. And there was things going on with my family. So, but I wanted to keep free diving because it, it, I felt good. Mm. It kept me motivated. It kept me inspired to keep going and trying new things. And it just, you know, it was almost like it saved me in a way that Mm. I, I was able to just stay in touch with Julia with who I was rather than kind of becoming attached to outside influences that could, you know, damage me or, or hurt me mm. or, you know, I always had this thing to go back to. So while I had a lot of stuff going on, I, um, I decided to compete in the Australian pool nationals. So I did that in, I think it was March. I think it was March this year. Or June. No, hang on, don't remember much April. I think it was April. I can't exactly remember the date. But I've never competed in pool before. And so many people don't do pool championships. So many mm. people don't compete in the pool. Because it is so hard. So hard. Like in the ocean when you're diving, you know, you kind of you have your body changes and within seven days of diving depth, I feel like my body change. I feel like I become a real mammal i become you know a secret the mammalian dive reflex really kicks in you you know you you feel you can tell your body when you're on a boat hey we're going in now and you just feel the changes that occur you feel your senses change you feel it's so hard you you can't explain what happens you transform in a way it may sound so weird and And that's physically crazy energetically Yes, um, physically and uh, yeah, physically and energetically, and it's amazing how your body and your mind work together. Mm. It's incredible. What we are capable of is incredible. Like in the ocean, underwater, it's incredible. <laughs> um, so I thought, okay, I'll do the, a pool competition, and so many people, um, for example. One of, you know, a couple of the girls who did the depth competition in Bali, they were like, "There's no way we're doing pool." Yeah. So. I thought, okay, well, I'm going to give it a go and work with my coach and see what I can do. And I was so hesitant. Like my training was good. I only had 10 days of training. How think, do you train for free diving? Like cruise around every day holding your breath? Like um, in the pool. You in just pool. do lots of, um, yeah, lots of different kind of um Things, lots of CO2 mm. tables, lots of swimming lots laps underwater, like building up your CO2 in the water. So doing like heaps of laps and just building up your resistance to your yep. contractions and things like that. It's really painful <laughs> mm. at times. Um, and just building up a resistance to continuing to be able to continue holding your breath and staying underwater and, you know, getting, getting used to the feeling of, of basically just getting back into the groove like the mentality of it, like mm. don't freak out, don't panic, it's okay. Because after a period of time when you hold your breath, your body starts to contract. Contractions. Yeah. yeah. So it's just about getting used. Like you do exercises that bring on contractions. Right. Like quite fierce contractions sometimes and it's about working through those contractions and it is so hard. Yes. <laughs> so. Because there's. Because my understanding is it's not it's not just the oxygen that you're drawing on that's in your lungs. You're drawing on the oxygen in your blood mm-hmm. and, and and in your muscles and everything. And there's a lot more oxygen in the store tank than you realise. Yeah, loads. and then those contractions are when almost when you run out of the oxygen in your lungs, and so your your diaphragm's going, come on, come on, come on. Let's yeah, go. breathe, 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 and you're like, so no, you're having to no. overcome a, a an very urge to breathe, deep seated, almost genetically wired. Yeah. Yep. Body response. Yep. And when you dive depth, you don't want to have big contractions at depth because everything is compressed. Yes. So you have to really make sure you're in a good headspace. You have to really prepare 
and believe in yourself and know that nothing can touch you. And when you commit to that dive, you are 100% committed to that dive. There's nothing that you can allow to bring you out of your zone. I say you become bulletproof. Like you have to become bulletproof. You have to be, or you just have to become completely, you know, cut off to the rest of the world. Nothing can touch you. And that's the kind of meditative state that I go into when I dive. So do you so. spend time as, as well as the pool work, do you mm. spend time meditating and doing no. this inner mental game stuff or is it all linked in with the It's train? all linked in with the ocean or with mm. the water, yeah, because I just find it so much more. I find I'm much more in the zone <laughs> if I'm in, in the water um, and with the mammalian dive reflex, you know, it, it we all of our heart rates slow down when we get in the water. Yes. That's what part of it. So, yeah, it's, it's really – it's an interesting way to go. I think – like and it's an interesting way to go down, should I say? It's it's um something that the level of meditation or the level of you know zoning out that I go to, I've never experienced it with any other kind of sport before. Right, so, it must get quite addictive. Um, it does when you're doing it, but it also can be really hard to get to if you're tired or if you have other things affecting you, or you mm. ha- you know you might be emo- you might wake up one morning and you're upset. You know, trying to block that out and hold your breath is really hard. Yeah. Really hard. So or just everyday occurrences. Yeah. Open the post and got a speeding ticket. Totally. How do you, to, how do you deal with that? How do you deal with that in the training <laughs> oh my session? God. Yeah. So free diving teaches you how to deal with that too. So Excellent. you kind of apply what you learn um, in the water and to a comp- in a competition, you apply that to opening a letter and getting a speeding ticket. Your reaction. It's more controlled, I find. Right. So what you're learning through freediving, you're also applying to. Yeah. Or, or letting seep out into other parts of your life. Yeah. So, you know, I know when I went to World Championships, um, so I did the pool competition, didn't really love it that much. I did make my static um, attempt, which was four minutes. I wanted four minutes 30. That was my goal. I did that. It's um, just lying face down in the water mm, yeah. for four and a half minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, like, you look a bit shocked <laughs> no no I, I did the research before this so <laughs> yeah. and um you know i must confess that i did a little bit of free diving in the uk before i came oh Australia. cool so yeah but carry on <laughs> yeah so four and a half minute breath hold and then i wanted i didn't know i didn't really know again where i would go with my oh that's the other thing so in the pool you don't announce anything you just do it just do it yeah So depth you have to announce, especially for safety precautions. So Mm. your safety divers and your judges and, you know, the safety team on the surface knows where you're going and they can see you, where you are, your heart rate, everything like that. In the pool, they just see you and you have your divers swimming next to you. But, yeah, you don't announce either. So you never know what anyone else is doing. So this is out-and-out competition. (laughs) Yeah. So it's like, you know, we had two of the best – we had Ant Williams and Ant Judge going head to head in the lane next to each other. They're two of Australia's best freedivers. Ant, hold, uh, Ant Judge holds, I think, eight national records, and Ant Williams holds some as well. And they're just incredible athletes. And never before had they kind of competed side by side. And we had them competing side by side this year. No one knew what they were going to do. It was the most probably watched event and most anticipated event for the actual, the whole entirety of the nationals. So um, watching them compete and not knowing what was going to happen was super exciting. And also, yeah, I don't know, watching a pool, watching pool competitions is more exciting in a way, I guess, because, yeah, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know mm. what people are going to do. You don't know if someone's going to black, black out or um, yeah, you, you kind of – you can only prepare for yourself yes. for, for your, your depths and, or, I mean, your, how long you're going to be underwater for. So, yeah, it's, um, it's really hard. <laughs> so I have a couple um, – the Japan Pool Championships are in March, the Pan, mm. Pan Pacifics, and I've entered and I'm going to do it, um, but I'm really nervous about mm. it already. So yeah. you, you go from the Australian Championships yep. and then – off the world championships. Yep. So I did you train hard for that. The yep. So the world championships of 2017 that were in August. Um, 
I went to Hawaii. So before I left my life in Sydney for three months and, and decided to compete, now. yeah, yep. and decided to compete, I was really nervous about it because I was like, what am I doing? <laughs> I'm 30. I was 31 at the time. I'm like, I'm 31. I'm going to go swim in the ocean <laughs> and hold my breath. Like we're not even an Olympic recognized sport. No one really, a lot of people don't even know what freediving is. Not, not that that really mattered, but I didn't really, I'm like, where is this going to go? Is this, is this going to be a career? How can this be a career? No one will even sponsor us. You know, no one, no one thinks the freedives are crazy or, but just there was a lot of kind of doubt around it and also doubt in myself because I had these goals. I thought, okay, well, I want to do 50 meters in constant weight. I want to do 50 meters in free immersion and I want to do 45 meters in no fins. Wow. So that was putting on almost 50% increase to what I'd done only 10 months ago across all depths. So I had a bit of a freak out a month up to leaving and was this a mental freak out? Is this yeah, like, mental freak out. Like, oh. oh my gosh, what am I doing? What, why am I doing this? Am I capable of doing this? You know, all those little negative things we tell ourselves. Like, you, you can't do it. Just stay in the safe zone. Stay at home. Keep working your job. Don't go anywhere. It's okay here. You know, those kind of things. Don't leave the house. <laughs> Don't go underwater. Don't get on an airplane. You're crazy. Don't do it. Something could happen. Like all of those little things that make us doubt and question who we are. Did you so, take what you'd learned in freediving and apply that to this? Um, I think I just took. Or did you get caught in it? I think, I don't know what I did, but I worked through it. I just went and I honestly was, was it, on the fence with it. Was it sheer will that just got you on the It fence? was probably, yeah, probably sheer will. And I think the one main thing it was was my curiosity. Ah, uh, that came back. Yeah. I'm always curious. I'm a very curious person. <laughs> so I I got on the plane and I flew to Hawaii and I'm in Hawaii with the Australian depth champion and well and pool champion and the Australian sorry, the Australian male champion and the Australian female champion. And I'm meant to be diving with these guys for four weeks. And I don't know anything. You know, all I know is I did a free diving competition and I just did it because I don't know. I still was curious, whatever. So training with them and seeing how cool and calm and collected they were with their training and I'm still working out, you know, how to like, I don't know, equalize and and how do you turn your mind off, you know, just all the stuff that I had no idea and I would look at them and they would do it so effortlessly and just cruise down. Like Amber would be sitting on the surface and Ant would go, so what are you going to do today, Amber? And she'd say, oh, I'm just going to do like 50 no fins, whatever, or 50 constant weight. And she'd go and come back up and make it look so easy. And I had to just deal with all these demons of, oh, you can't do it and you you don't know what you're doing and, you know, just negativity. And you just kind you of, I chose to work through them. Right. So I made the choice. So you recognized them. Yeah. And then I went, right. Yeah. I recognized that I had a lot of self-doubt and I needed to work through that. And it was hard. Mm. And it brought up a lot of emotional stuff. And by the time I got where, to the where Caribbean. From all over your life. From all over my life. And by the time I got to the Caribbean, um, I I kind of had separated. Like Ant had gone back to Australia. Amber was staying somewhere else in the Caribbean and I was staying in a new place on my own and I was completely on my own. And for some reason, as soon as I hit the water, the first time I got back, got back into the water in the Caribbean, everything clicked, everything worked, everything felt right. Like it just felt right. And like, I just worked through all of this stuff that I knew was there that I needed to work through mm. And I like did. Delayering things and Yeah, like an onion, like peeling back all the layers yeah. and and um and, yeah. And, and I find sometimes and, and certainly listening to you there, um, when you put yourself out there, like you are by the very nature of it going to face all these demons and, and, yeah. and belief patterns that you have about them. And these beliefs they don't want to go easily. No. They'll go kicking and screaming. 
no, they kick and scream. Yeah, yeah. but just working through them bit by bit yeah. by bit. And it is so hard, so hard. It's so hard. You can either sit with those demons and those self, self-doubts self and those insecurities or you just smash them. Like you break those barriers of like internal, I don't know, discovery, as cheesy as that sounds. That's mm. kind of what it is. So, um, I yeah, I was training and it was all going great and then I hit a big wall. Um I, because freediving gets quite exhausting because it's quite an emotional sport too and being able to switch off and kind of, you know, just go down to 50 and hang out. Like, well, not hang out, but go down to 50 metres and then come back up again. It takes a lot of brain power to do that Um, because it's, you know, it's full on. It's exhausting. Mm. So I got to the Caribbean and I did have like a seven-day break between travel from Hawaii to the Caribbean and – I got there and I started training and it was great. And I was training independently now. I wasn't training with Amber and I wasn't training with Ant. I was just training on my own with myself and a safety diver. So it was all on me, everything. And I was still only at 43 meters. Mm. So I was seven meters off my target depth. And I was in the Caribbean for three weeks before competition. And somehow I did it <laughs> and I didn't I I just was so focused and visualization is a big part of of what helped me get to where I needed to go so Aunt Judge was kind of talking about um you guys need to visualize it's really important and I was like whatever <laughs> that sounds so silly like why would I want to pretend I'm diving and then we had another girl with us Lucia and I believe Amber was visualizing too and then I did I did try it in the Caribbean and I would sit in bed and close my eyes and go through the steps of my dive. So breathing up, slowing down my heart rate, getting to my relaxed mode, coming up, I'm on the surface, now going into the, you know, into the space where I'm diving and then visualize they clip my lanyard on, my depth gauge goes on, I'm holding the line. I have three minutes. I go into my zone and then the 30 seconds, you know, I have 30 seconds and then the 10 second official top countdown starts. And I visualize that and my eyes are still closed and I'm still holding the line and I know I'm about to go down and do my dive. So I get my, my lungs ready. I, I identify, you know, with my body. I talk to my body. I tell it, okay, we're about to go down. And I keep remembering to breathe. And then on that zero mark of that countdown, I do do my inhale, my full inhale. Um, Sorry, I put my nose clip on and then because I don't don't wear a mask. So nose clips on, I do my full inhale and I take my last breath and then I go. And as I'm going down, I remember to – keep my eyes open, depending on what discipline I'm doing. I'm staring at the line and I'm just relaxing and I'm telling myself, relax, relax, relax. And I'm visualizing dropping and I'm visualizing going down. Mm. And past 20 meters, I stop kicking. Because you're free falling. Because I'm free falling. I'm sinking. I'm yeah. dense. I'm I am sinking. plummet. I am going down into the abyss. And it's that point where you need to absolutely – shut everything out like from the beginning from the surface you have to shut everything out but you need to let yourself fall like you need to and you just kind of hear the lanyard you can hear the lanyard going as you're going down and that can be a little bit nerve-wracking at times but I had a chat to Amber about it and Amber was like, I love it when I hear the lanyard going. And I just laughed and that kind of in a way made me feel better. So sometimes if I hear the lanyard, I think of Amber and I kind of smile and then I'm okay and I go. And then I remember to do my mouth feel. So bringing up past a certain depth, I have to bring up the remainder of the air in my stomach into my mouth and close my throat with my glottis Mm. and keep that air within the upper area so I can equalize through my nasal cavities and my ears. 
Um, so that can really stuff up your dive if you lose your mouth. You that? that was my biggest challenge of the 2017 World Championships because I got there. I was only at 43 meters. I had three weeks to go and I started running out of EQ. Like that's why I stopped going down because I couldn't equalize. I'd run out of air. So then I had to learn within a week, which takes some freedivers years or months, how to bring up air, how to do a frog noise. Yeah, so if you go, you can see that. That's bringing up air from your stomach, like up into your cheeks. And then you have to hold that air in your cheeks and you have to be able to put pressure, like move that air around at a certain depth and push through the nose clip, obviously, the pressure, and then equalize. So that was very, very, very challenging, and I got very, very, very nervous about mm. that. But somehow I just worked on it and worked on it and worked on it. I was doing headstands like, in my in my hotel room with my friend Derek and keeping and, and, and closing my throat and doing all this stuff that everyone was doing because that was apparently how you equalized. And when I got it, I got it and it was great, but it was a very frustrating and testing time for me because it was the only thing that was stopping me from getting down to 50 metres. And then when we had Caribbean Cup, which was the competition, it was the pre-comp to the World Championships. So I did two competitions within a two-week period and I wasn't at 50 metres yet, but I, I did 45 metres no fins which I hadn't done before. I'd only done 43, but in comp we were allowed three metres and you're not supposed to do PBs in competition, but I did. I announced 40, 45 and I did it and that was the scariest dive I've ever done because I was, when I, I remember just tr- kind of all, like just I just knew that I was struggling a little bit, like I was borderline and that was really hard because you're pulling yourself, you're doing these strokes and you're using this energy to get to the surface and you're negatively buoyant. Yes. Yeah. Until you get past that 20. <laughs> Until you get past the 20 or the 18 for some people. 18. Yeah. So and you start to reinflate. Yeah. And then you come up and, you know, you see your safety divers. And as soon as you see your safety divers, you're like, yes, because your safeties will meet you at 30, 20, 10 and ones on the surface. And they're all free divers as well. Yes. So you see them and they give you a little like um, frog or a little croak, like to say hi. It's like, yeah. And you kind of, you're just so happy to see them <laughs> because you know, you, you know you're at 30. Because when you're going up, you can't check your gauge. Yeah. You're concentrating. You time for that. No. So um, that, that was the hardest dive I've done. And then I did a, f- I can't actually remember, I think I did a 48 um, free immersion. And then I did, I nom- I announced a 50 meter constant weight and I wasn't ready for it. And I did it and I turned early and I got a yellow card and my coach was really disappointed mm. and I let ego get in the way. I was like, I can do 50 meters. I'm ready, but I couldn't equalize. I wasn't relaxed. So I was getting to 47 and I was freezing up. So you have to relax. So not only are you 47 meters underwater, with your body that's super compressed, <laughs> with holding your breath, you have to stay completely relaxed the whole time because things stop working. Your mind, your body, they don't want to talk to each other unless you're really relaxed. So, yeah, that was a challenging kind of disheartening point of that competition. Um, but I learned a lot from it. and took that to the World Championships. I took it to World Championships and instead of announcing 48 metres for my constant no fins I announced 50 um so because I was tired sorry I announced 45 because I was tired um and I didn't I just I learned my lesson from the Caribbean Cup that I shouldn't announce depth if I know that I'm tired yes because that's when you start making mistakes so I announced 45 and I did my 45 and I got all white cards and I was really happy and I did a yeah really good performance and um yeah, it was. I was just so happy that I had achieved my three month goals and taken my time and learnt a lot in the process. And it was hard. And now I have Japan coming up in March, 
for pools and it's a discipline that I really it's a, it's a competition I really don't like I really mm. don't like doing the pool which is why you should go which is why I'm going <laughs> so what have you learned about Julia during this free diving trip um what have I learned about Julia that um you you really can you do have the ability to control your emotions and how people around you can affect you like it's you, you, it's your choice. It's no one else's choice. So if someone says something to you that bothers you, it's your choice, how you react and you can control that reaction too. So yeah, it's just about knowing that I have choices and that if I want to work through something, I can because I choose to. And if I don't want to work through something, it's a pretty good damn reason as to why I don't want to. Or if I don't like someone or something, Again, there's a good reason for it. It's all choice. So yeah. we have these choices in life and we have loads of choices in life every day. But it's just about committing to the choices that you make. Mm. And when you do commit to them wholeheartedly, and I mean putting your heart on the line and your mind and your soul, like your entire being on the line of that choice, Things do happen and you can get to where you want to go. And I think I already knew that anyway, but not to the extent emotionally. Like it was kind of more on the surface for me and now it's like it's deep. It's deep. Lol. (laughs) Like free diving deep. So, yeah. yeah. No pun intended. No pun intended. I mean, obviously it's uh, um, that there is risk with it. Yeah. Have you had to consider your own mortality in doing this? Um, I did. Like I was in a quite a, a bad space when I left my partner and I was free diving, you know, for the competition and I felt like, oh, I don't really care, you know, this is fine. Like if I black out, whatever, who cares? Like I was just feeling sad. Um, but then, no, I, I believe I will be fine because I believe in my confidence and I believe in my ability to make the right decisions about how my body and my mind are feeling. So if I feel don't dive, Julia, then I don't dive. So I'm, I don't really worry about it. And also freediving competitions are so safe. You know, we have really good teams. We have really good people everybody celebrates everyone's dives everyone celebrates everyone's achievements and everyone's also supportive for the people that don't achieve and everyone wants everyone to do well essentially and and be successful in themselves with their performance or be happy with what they, with their performance so if someone doesn't make a dive we all feel it you know, because it's a huge thing to go and do and go down there and hold your, yeah, put yourself on the line. and down. Yeah. So, yeah, and it really does suck when you, you see someone not reach their goal, especially if they've been, you know, one of my friends who was in the championships with me, she was working so hard towards a depth and she didn't make it. And, I just felt so bad for her because I know she can make it, but it just probably wasn't the right time for her at that moment. And that's another thing. Like sometimes timing doesn't work. Sometimes it's not your time, time, but it doesn't mean that that's forever. It means maybe at that point it's not your time, but it could happen and it could come about and don't give up. Like if you've got a dream or a goal, just go hard, Mm. but also have the ability (laughs) to walk away from it at times and go, I'm exhausted. I'm not interested. And that's the same with everything. I think like with relationships or if something doesn't feel good inside you, listen to that instinct because it's there for a reason and it's telling you something. Don't ignore it. Act on it. Mm. Free diving life. There you go. (laughs) Same thing. Tell me about the Bali video. The Bali. Okay. The trash. The trash. So, I was training last year um, before the competition with, with my friend Trista from West Australia, Trista Fontana, and we were diving out on a line and or I can't remember, we're either at the hotel or out on the buoy, but um, all of a sudden there's all this trash around us. 
and there was about two to three tons of it and it was disgusting That's and we video. went swimming through it. Yeah, it was so gross and it was so scary because we were swimming in the ocean, you know. We look at the ocean around the world and we, we, we've we grown up with these beautiful pristine pictures yeah. of the ocean. And, and if, you, if you watch the video, the plastic aside, the, the water is clear and it's blue and it looks lovely. Yeah. But... There's just all this plastic there. I mean, there's a bit where you come up and you've got this plastic over your head. Yeah, a plastic bag over my head. That was awful. That was so scary. You know, I just felt suffocated in trash. Mm. And it touches your skin and you're swimming through, you know, you see these fish eating it and, you know, you, you just dive down. And I, I thought, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to dive down and get away from it. And I just dove, dove down and it was all around me. Mm. And, um, yeah, it was just so much plastic, so many plastic bags, plastic wrappers, water bottles, like plastic cups, lots of styrofoam, um, things that just shouldn't be in the ocean. Yeah. And it was really, really, really scary. Did you put it on social media, YouTube, with the intent of getting it out Yeah, there? I put it, I published it, and I went to a news, a global news agency, and it's accumulated over like three, or three to four million views now. Um, What's been the response? People are completely disturbed by it, <laughs> hmm. really disturbed. And people seem to be quite angry and a lot of people aren't even aware that this is a problem. You know, single-use plastics are something that we can avoid using. And as well, you know, it's coffee cups. When you go and get a coffee, take a recyclable coffee cup. Plastic straws should just not exist. You know, everything that we put in the garbage bin, if it's not recycled, it goes to landfill and it ends up in the ocean. And it's becoming, well, it's not becoming, it is a massive problem now. So it's great to be able to share that content and say to people, hey, this is real. And one day, if we don't do something, you're going to have a child and take your kid down to the beach and, you know, Bondo Beach which is just going to be covered in trash. You won't mm. want to go on the well, ocean. Cottesloe Beach. Can you imagine Cottesloe Beach just covered in garbage? It's what's happening. This is the thing. It's happening and we can all turn a blind eye to it or we can do something about it. You know, when I go to the shops, I take my own bags. When I go and have a coffee, I take a reusable coffee cup. You know, little tiny things. I have a water bottle, which is actually in my car, that I, I've had for eight months now. It's just a 50-50 flask. So I can have either hot, you know, hot stuff or cold stuff in it. And I, it's a one-liter flask and I have it religiously every day with water in it and I don't buy plastic bottles and yeah every little thing every little bit counts and we can all make a difference by just you know doing our best to not use plastic mm. so is that how you got involved with the um, perfect word foundation and the take three from the sea I really like that idea taking three pieces away yeah from the beach yeah, Take Three from the Sea. Um, so Take Three from the Sea is an organisation that, you know, has that basic message of don't, you know, try and recycle and reuse or just avoid using certain things. Um, so I'm just pulling up a stat here. But basically in Australia, um, 13 beverage containers are used every year um, and less than half are recycled. So let me just say that again, 13 billion beverage containers. So... In Australia. In Australia By two alone. Point, was it 2.3, 2.4 million people? Yeah. 13 billion. So if you think about that and think about that in the ocean, every year it's pretty scary stuff. Mm, and that's just Australia. That's just Australia. Yeah. So take three encourages people to clean up trash wherever they are. I mean, if I'm walking down the street and I see trash, I pick it up. Even if it's not my own, I don't ignore it. It's all of our responsibilities to keep our oceans clean. You know, don't point the finger at someone else. Mm. Just pick it up yourself. And especially at the beach, you know, if you see trash, pick it up. Put it in the bin. Put it in the recycling bin. Now there's um, there's a, a scheme, like a new, not a scheme, sorry, wrong word. Um, let's see the name here. It is, um, hang on. You, there's a machine, basically, mm. that exists now in New South Wales where you can take your plastic bottle to the machine, put it in the machine, and you get $0.05 cents per bottle that you recycle. Sorry, $0.10 cents per bottle. 
So, you and know, what does the machine do? With the, it recycles everything. So you have glass in one hole and you have plastic in the other. And yeah, you can make 10 cents per bottle. So the other day I was down at the beach with Take Three with Tim Silverwood, who's the CEO. And we spent, it was on Monday, we spent five hours. We spent, sorry, three hours walking the streets of Bondi, going through normal trash bin, like trash cans. So you've got your recyclable bins and then you've got your normal waste bins. And we pulled out 480 bottles from normal bins or something like that. Maybe it wasn't that many. It was roughly like an estimated 400, three to 400 bottles from the normal bins. So people are so slack that they're not even putting it into the recycling. Yep. So we pulled all these bottles out. We, there was a lot of trash on the streets as well. Not too much, but there were a few bottles that we picked up in the street. We bagged everything up and we went to this machine in Taronga, which is, you know, it's a government made machine. And we recycled and made like $31, you know, which made your breakfast. Yeah, and, you know, we, we donated it to Take Three as well. So mm. there's an option where you can donate or you can keep money. So, mm. yeah, it's – and it was rewarding. It was cool. <laughs> so, you know, rather than those three to 400 bottles going into landfill, we just recycled them and made 31 bucks. So, nice. yeah. So Take Three does a lot of stuff like that, um, which is super cool. And Tim and the Take Three team are super passionate as well. Mm. So, yeah. So – I've, I've sort of, um, I've been keen to get you on the show for a while and I've been following you on Instagram and, you know, I see pictures, Tahiti, and Caribbean <laughs> and here and there yeah. and everywhere. How, how do you sustain this lifestyle? How do you, how do you actually make some money <laughs> to sustain this lifestyle? Because so, you said earlier on, free diving is not a sport that gets lots of sponsorship. No, no. So I work really, really hard. Um, I've had a photography business for, eight years now. So I make my own income just independently mm. and, you know, it's okay. And I can support myself financially. Um, I always have supported myself financially and I always put the money where, you know, it always ends up in conservation or free diving. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I'm not loaded or anything, um, but I get by and, I'm really passionate about raising awareness behind, you know, the plight of the oceans and also endangered species conservation, which is the TV show that I've been building on or working on for four years. Um, so, yeah, I just kind of go hard really and I I don't know, sometimes I get worried. I think, oh, my gosh, where's my next income going to be? But it always kind of works out. And also I do have a couple of sponsors that I'm probably going to be working with as of January, who, you know, that's been something that's been kind of in the pipeline. Um, and they're really cool sponsors. There's two of them. And I was in Europe meeting them. Um, and, yeah, I guess they're really supportive with what I do. And I think it's really important to find that kind of team or those people who, mm. who do back you. So, you know, freediving is cool, but it's also, for me, it's cooler if I can – you know, pass on the message that, you know, we need to save the oceans through doing that. That's almost more, that's kind of drives me to, to do, to be a free diver, to mm. compete. Yeah. So that signal in itself is bringing support. Yeah. So I'm becoming more like secure in it. It does take a while, <laughs> um, but I'm just, I don't know, like I said, if you're really determined or you really want something or something interests you or you want to investigate it or put yourself completely on the line, you will find that it's either going to happen or it's not the right time. So, yeah, I think it'll be good. It'll be good. And also even committing to a sponsor is scary. <laughs> it's like, well, because, you know, you don't want to let anyone down. And freediving has been a very personal sport for me. It's that I've something I've done for myself and I want to keep doing it for myself. I don't want to do it for anyone else. Yes. So um, it's just about maintaining that with your brand, with your sponsors mm. and finding the right sponsors too. So mm. I have had a lot of, you know, I have had, yeah, quite a few sponsorship approaches over the last few years, even with my photography. And I had a really good, offer about two years ago it was awesome it was incredible and I turned it down because I wasn't I didn't believe in the brand or right. the product so 
yeah, that's my other problem. I don't really do things for money. Money doesn't drive me. Mm. <laughs> so if I was passionate about money, I think I'd be a billionaire and a banker. But unfortunately, I like animals and holding my breath. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we've gone down that road for now. Excellent. Mm-hmm. Excellent. So um, what does... Um, What does the next five to 10 years hold for Julia? What does success look like? So I want to have my TV show up and running, um, which is all about me as an investigative photojournalist working behind the scenes with people who rescue, rehabilitate and defend wildlife um, all over the globe. So, I mean, some of the episodes would be in Asia, say like the Siberian tiger, go to Russia, and then you've got the Indian elephant, um, you've got the pangolin. There's eight species of pangolin in the world. So they're all endangered. The, the pangolin is actually the most trafficked animal in the world. Then you've got, you know, even the rhino in South Africa. You've got the hooded vulture, extremely endangered on the red list. Um, there's so many animals that are endangered, like even the pygmy hippopotamus, which is the cutest little hippopotamus we've ever seen. And there's, there's species of animals that people don't know exist. And they're all kind of, you know, they're trying to survive. <laughs> so it's a, it's a, a story which goes behind the scenes, works with these incredible people who are so inspiring and so dedicated to preserving our wildlife and preserving, you know, the natural environments of what nature originally gifted us on this planet. And it's just, it's exciting and it's interesting and it's inspiring and I really want to get back out there <laughs> and do it. So um, at the moment I'm working with a production company in, in Australia, in Sydney, um, who I signed up with earlier this year in March. But before that it was a three-year project that I was funding myself with my cameraman who is based in New Zealand. And the concept has always been a bit, you know, where is this going? It all started with a sm- with an idea on a piece of paper. And now we have our three and a half minute trailer and we went back and filmed a pilot, which was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life again. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's just hopefully I'll just be doing that for the next 10 years and free diving as well. So I'd like to have, you know, a few months of the year competing and then a f- like half of the year doing my show and then probably two to three months of the year with my family and holidays because I'll need it. Nice. So that's kind of where I want things to go and what I'm working towards. Yeah. Can you see yourself um, winning anything at free diving? I don't know. I don't know. I um, I don't know. There's honestly, I think I just need to keep the same attitude that I have, which is all about what am what am I capable of? What's Julia capable of? You know what? How far are you going to go today? How much do you believe in yourself? What are you ready for? Is this your time yep. or is your time next year? So I think I'll just stick with those thoughts. And if I win a competition, rad. If I don't, I don't really care, to be honest, mm. because I just enjoy it. The sport is so enjoyable and I want to keep it like that. I don't want to put expectations like on things. So, yeah. I was interested to see what your answer was to that. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> what um, would be one thing we'd be surprised to know about, Julia? Oh my gosh. I don't know. Um, ask my sister. <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, one thing to know about me. Um, um, I don't know. <laughs> I, um, I don't know. What's weirder than holding my breath? I like holding my breath. <laughs> I can hold my breath for a long time. <laughs> um, there isn't anywhere that I won't go. Right. Uh, there isn't, I've, yeah, there isn't anywhere that I won't go. There you go. <laughs> um, what would be your advice to someone out there who um, is interested in going out and making a difference, um, you know, um, passionate about the environment and whatnot? Yep. Yeah. Um, if you're passionate about making a difference and you don't know how, the best thing to do is just get online and look at the areas or Google the areas that you're interested in mm. and you'll always find organizations. But just read about them, read reviews about them and see what kind of work they're doing. Like there are so many organizations that are, you know, 
I don't know, that are startups or have been around for a while and aren't really making a difference. But, you know, look at look at a, an organization's following and look at their volunteer programs. I always like to go to places and meet people if I'm going to work with them or give them money or dedicate my time or anything like that. So just be thorough with your investigations before committing to a cause. Super. And finally, what's the best bit of advice you've ever received? Grab the bull by the horns. <laughs> Who told you that? Um, my friend, um, my friend Justin Hammers. He's the he uh, owns Maryvale, um, which is one of Sydney's biggest nightclub chains. I've yep. known Justin for fourteen years. He's a good friend, and he's very, very successful and very driven. And um, he's got a beautiful family. And he just always said that to me. He goes, <laughs> he's like, baby, just grab the bull by the horns. So I really like that. And I guess that's kind of what I do in a way when I want to try something out, I go for it. So go for it and don't listen to anyone else. Just do what feels right. You know, (laughs) go for it. Excellent. Julia, thank you so much for coming and spending time talking with me today. And thank you for giving us such an insight into quite a mystical sport um it's not exactly a spectator sport we don't see it on tv as hopefully much. it's becoming one hopefully it's becoming yeah. a spectator sport i did yeah. notice that you know they had sort of live um facebook feeds yeah while you were doing your diving yeah um at the world champs and what have you so yeah but you know it's, it's a mystical sport it it um, seems kind of strange on the surface of holding your breath and disappearing off into the ocean but um yeah listening to you today it it, it Broke it down and, and there's just so it's much all choice. It. It's, it's all, all just making a choice. Like choose to, you know, break your own barriers that you create for yourself and you'll be surprised. Indeed. And I think that's the biggest <laughs> thing that's come out of this. Yeah. So, Julia, thank you for your time. No worries. I'd like to thank the listeners for listening in. Um, pretty sure you'll have got stacks out of this. <laughs> and um, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> no thank you. <laughs>